right. Excited for this panel. This is going to be a very interesting discussion, debate. We've encouraged lively, respectful debate here with both of you. Great lineup. Great to have you both on stage. I believe for the first time appearing together here. Yes. So we have Godfrey, Godfrey Lee Brandt, CEO of Swift, and Brad Gerlinghouse, CEO of Ripple. I'm going to jump right into it with a big picture question. We're at a fintech conference here. Start with you, Gottfried. Why is Swift the future of cross-border payments? Why is Swift the future of cross-border payments? Because uh, two answers. I think one is because we have 10,000 banks on the network, and and that I think is a, is a resilient system, correspondent banking. Uh, and the the other reason is we're innovating like uh, like crazy. So the the big, and I'm quite proud of that. The big innovation that we introduced uh, three years ago called GPI, Global Payments Innovation, which really takes correspondent banking into the 21st uh, century. We um, um, essentially, we introduce a unique identifier for each payment, so you can now track your payments uh, all the way uh, through. We provided a set of uh, rules for speed, um, and we provided transparency on the, on the pricing. Uh, that has greatly enhanced the experience for uh, customers. That's what it's all about. I was in China last week, not the week before last, last week was uh, Switzerland, um, where the Chinese banks tell me every payment we now send to the US is there within minutes. Um, so yeah, it's nice that you have tracking, but actually now, cross-border payments really has, has improved. Um, the same I hear from corporates, we can now track it, it's transparent, etc. And I think the other great news is that because we already have the network, we can roll it out, make it backward compatible, etc. So we now have um, more than half the payments globally are on that new platform. Um, uh, most of those arrive within half an hour, end-to-end, -end, customer to, uh, to customer. We've signed up uh, about uh, over 400 banks. All of the top 60 are, are on there, and we are uh, basically looking towards general uh, adoption in another year and a half. And then the whole of correspondent banking will be on that new platform. People will be able to track it. It will be fast, um, and it will be uh, transparent. And with that, you get all the benefits of the existing model, which is bank-centric, deep liquidity with all the controls that the banks have built around it, KYC, sanction, screening, and, and, and all of the compliance controls uh, that go uh, with it. So I'm extremely excited about it, and I think, I mean, I, I, I do, of course, have to acknowledge the competition, <laughs> uh, which is always good. Um, I, I, I don't think we could have done this without a competition making it clear to the banks that they need to shape up their acts, so that, that we, we did jointly uh, with them. We could also not have done it without the new technology. API, for us, is the big technology that that made this uh, possible, uh, which is under the hood. Um, and with that, I am really looking at cross-border payments and our banking community for another 100 years of uh, resilient and uh, good, good experience for customers. Brad, what do you have to say to that? Well, I think we are moving into a new world order. I, I think the internet of value, uh, you know, Ripple talks a lot about what payments look like, not just you know, today, but in 10, 20 years. And when we think about that, we talk about this internet of value. How do we let value move the way information moves today? Uh, I think about the, the dynamic between Ripple and Swift, not dissimilar to the dynamic between you know, when Amazon in 1997, 1998, and you got Walmart. Uh, and you know, I, certainly, it's a David and Goliath kind of classic story. I, I think that the challenge is you're dealing with, when, when Ripple thinks about the future of the internet of value, really democratizing payments, reducing costs dramatically, increasing speed dramatically, we're really thinking about it the same way we introduced new technologies like TCP IP and HTTP that became the internet of information. You know, when we talk about what the SWIFT network is today, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a closed network. It has a lot of members on it for sure, but AOL had a lot of members. And when we moved into the age of the internet at a decentralized, democratic uh, network, uh, I think that you, what you're seeing introduced with blockchain technologies, and it's, by the way, it's not just Ripple. When we think about interoperability, we think about interoperability between many blockchains. And uh, you know, I, I think that the, the future we see is uh, certainly you know, one of many networks, interoperable networks, and reducing the friction of those payments to close to zero. And I think you're going to see a lot of innovation spawn from that, part from Ripple and part from a, an entire ecosystem. Uh, so I'll also agree very much with what Godfrey said at the end. Competition has clearly been a good thing for Swift. You know, I, I think that uh, I do think what has happened at GPI is a big step forward. You know, for 40 plus years we had a, a construct around how cross-border correspondent banking worked. It it worked, 
but it had a lot of limitations. We're seeing that move forward, but I think uh, it's a step forward when you're switching from kind of, you know, if I may, horse and buggy to, you know, hey, can, can, we, can we make the horse and buggy go faster? Sure, but if we can actually just move to a Ferrari, let's do that. So you've said before that you think there's a world where Ripple could take over Swift. Well, I've also said I thought there was ways we could work with Swift. Let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start that comment just by saying, look, it, Swift is, own, I mean, I think Godfrey, by the way, has a very challenging job. Hmm. Swift is owned by the banks. It isn't a traditionally uh, kind of construct. You have a very strong chairman uh, in, in how City kind of is a, an important stakeholder in that. But at the end of the day, Ripple's trying to help financial institutions and banks be successful in the future. How do we enable uh, you know, Satander to compete more effectively with PayPal, with Amazon, Facebook? And it's not going to be in you know, settlement times measured in days. It's not going to be measured, you know, uh, settlement costs measured in you know, 15 plus dollars. So I, I want to see our, our mission in life really has been how do we help these financial institutions be successful? Those are the same financial institutions that own SWIFT. And so in many ways, we've thought, hey, we could work together. That, that hasn't played out. And I think increasingly, you know, we are seeing more and more banks adopt Ripple's technology. And uh, we're seeing that, that play out. And, but I have a ton of respect for what SWIFT has built, just to be clear. Gottfried, how do you feel about a partnership with Ripple? Well, first, we can negotiate it here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. Uh, maybe a couple. Of, one is um, there's two types of competition. I think the the one is between the bank centric model, and then there's lots of people who are trying to build cross border payments outside of the bank system, and that's that's an interesting one to watch. And and there you could see a, a shift in in paradigm. I do think that there will going forward be a crucial role for banks. There's a reason we have banks. There's a reason they're regulated and all of that. So I I don't see the role of banks going away if they innovate fast enough, which they I think uh, appear to be uh, appear to be doing. So it's the banks uh, to lose. Um, so from that perspective, um, we uh, we are on the same on the same boat of being of having a, a bank centric uh, model. In terms of one of the exciting things about the new GPI platform is the, the fact that it is extremely interoperable and, and open, and we've always had links to other networks. We're going to enhance that with API access. Um, we are uh, announcing, I think, uh, later today, a proof of concept with uh, R3, uh, an R3 uh, blockchain on trade, where you can initiate a payment on the trade platform, and then it goes into, uh, into GPI. Um, so we are, we're exploring interconnectivity with a lot of things, and, and Banks have always been about that, uh, that interconnectivity. Uh, right now, you can, I mean, to some extent, you can already do that. Eh? If something there is on Swift as well, so they can act as the, the peering point between the, between the two, uh, two new networks. So the last thing we want to be is a closed system. I think the world belongs to open systems uh, going forward. Um, and that's, that's I mean, another interesting example is um, in a lot of countries, we now see real-time systems uh, emerging, domestic real-time systems, uh, several of them on the SWIFT network. We, we, in Australia, they went live last year with the Australia new payment platform, real-time domestic, um, that runs on our rails in, uh, in Australia. And we are now um, working with four countries in Southeast Asia to interconnect the real-time systems that they have there using GPI as the glue between them. So essentially, you go from country to country, leveraging both the domestic real-time rails and the cross-border uh, GPI. The other thing that excites me about it is um, I firmly expect that within a few years, GPI will be de facto real-time uh, cross-border. And the way that works is because now for the first time you can track your payments, we already see that banks are starting to see where the bottlenecks are. So if it, if it doesn't arrive within minutes, they can see what's holding it up. You can also see which banks are still on batch processing and which banks have already, most of the banks have moved to real-time uh, process. So this is actually, this transparency puts more pressure on the banks to improve their, uh, their speed. Um, and by the way, it's always good to keep in mind that Swift has never been the bottleneck. We run a telco, a network that transmits the messages in seconds. It's also good to keep in mind that uh, cross-border payments, the $10, $10 that you mentioned, are part of that thing. A Swift message costs three cents uh, at the end of the day. So we've, we've always provided a, speed, a speedy and cheap uh, uh, connectivity. Um, I think what it is about now is to enable the banks to leverage that and really make it work uh, in, in seconds as well. And I, I am completely convinced that in a few years you will have the experience over SWIFT and the banking system to be able to do it end-to-end -end in, in a matter of seconds. We will, we will see that evolution thanks to the, the transparency that the platform provides. Gottfried, why not use Ripple's technology to do that? 
Because, well, we'll have to see. I, I think what we are seeing, uh, um, we, we had a long discussion about blockchain uh, versus uh, API. Um, uh, what we could see is the API technology, which is at the heart of what we do with uh, GPI, is here today. Um, and, and banks are able to integrate it. Blockchain, we think, is further out. We've, we've run a large proof of concept with blockchain to, uh, several proof of concepts, I should say. Uh, one of them to put it inside the reconciliation between banks, Nostro Vostro, uh, the, the account reconciliation between banks. We had 40 banks participate in that. It was the largest hyperledger implementation outside IBM, really big, 500 bilateral relationships on the blockchain, 500 individual blockchains uh, being run. When we evaluated it with banks, they said, yeah, it works as a proof of concept, but it's not clear to us that it's that much better than what we have today, given the migration cost. Um, and, and a lot of it is about the banks themselves who have to migrate and be interoperating with that new platform. We find that for them it's much easier to integrate with APIs and what we're now offering them with GPI than it is with, with blockchain. Uh, so that, that has been our experience so far, and, and our, our 10,000 banks worldwide play a big role in, in that one. They have to be ready for that technology. Brad, do you want to respond as to why that might not be the case? Well, I, I think you know the, uh, the, the Swift model. We can talk about open APIs. We can talk about open networks, Bigger but picture. it isn't. I mean, it's Swift is a it's a it's a Swift controlled API, and even you know I, I'm complimentary of what GPI has represented in terms of accelerating what has been you know a, a relatively slow process. GPI, I think, is a big step forward, but it's still a there's a central database where you're querying a, stat a transaction status, and so that's you know, a central operator. I think, you know, uh, I mean, Gottfried said, is, and I agree with, decentralized systems, I think, over time, as we've seen with things like TCP IP, are likely to win. And uh, I think that today is not what SWIFT is. And you know, when we think about how to enable a transaction from you know, a Barclays account to an Impeza wallet, uh, mobile wallet, you know, that, that when we think about an internet of value, it's not just about the banks, for sure. Yes, it's about regulated institutions, and we're certainly not trying to circumvent those things. But you know, I, I think it is, it's fundamentally kind of a, a different view of how the world may play out. Yeah, maybe to that, I mean, a, a big part of the, of the value proposition of Ripple, I think, is the cryptocurrency, the XRP. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's another one worthy of debate. Um, there we do find that the banks are also at least when they talk to us, they may tell you different things. They are hesitant to, to convert things into a currency, a cryptocurrency right now because of the, the volatility in the, the currencies, because of the fact that you don't have the deep liquidity that you have in, for example, the dollar as a clearing, uh, as a clearing unit uh, at the end of the day. Um, so again, when we engage, engage banks, they, we don't find them ready for a model where you convert it into crypto and then convert it back. And that has to do with many things, regulation, volatility, and all, all the things that are... That are so the, debated around crypto, but that's a whole separate debate. Th this is well, it's not really a separate debate because I think there's two important things about this, and Gottfried mentioned this earlier. Swift today is a one-way messaging framework. It, it actually isn't a liquidity provider, right? It's Swift messaging partnered with bank liquidity. When we think about an internet of value, it's a mixture of two-way messaging frameworks, you know, moving to real-time, a, a chatty protocol, if you will, coupled with real-time liquidity, and it, you know the the, the I hear people talk about volatility, and I feel like they're propagating misinformation. The, the, the volatility risk of fiat, it, you know, well, volatility is just a mathematical calculation of time times volatility. If you hold fiat for, let's say, an average SWIFT transaction today is in the order of magnitude two days, that's about 180,000 seconds. An XRP transaction is three seconds. So if you take a low volatile asset times a long duration, fiat, or a high volatility asset versus a very, very short amount of time, it turns out mathematically there's less volatility risk in an XRP transaction than there is in a fiat transaction. The difference is you have market makers. When you do a SWIFT transaction, there's banks saying, there's a market maker saying, I'll lock in that rate. I'll take the volatility risk for the next two or three days. With XRP, you don't have to do that because it settles so quickly. Gottfried, this gets to a little bit more of the skepticism over cryptocurrencies, which I know is separate from Ripple, but let's just get into digital assets for a second. Where do you stand on the role of digital assets in the future of, of the payment system, of the banking system more broadly? I mean, 
first, most assets we have today are digital. Let, let's also say, I mean, if you hold stocks today, uh, there are no more physical papers anymore. They're just registered. I mean, it's a funny anecdote. Uh, when we had um, Hurricane Sandy that flooded uh, New York uh, five years ago, um, one of the places that got flooded was DTCC. They have a big vault in the basement. <laughs> Their address is Water Street, by the way, in Manhattan. That should, <laughs> that should have been a giveaway. Um, the vault where all the US stocks, the still the physical copies are held, was flooded by uh, Hurricane Sandy, uh, salt water, etc. Um, they had a huge effort to recover all of those, but at the end of the day, it didn't matter because you no longer hold these physical things. It's all, it's all digital at the end of the day. A, a central securities depository is a register of, of who owns which assets. So by de facto, most assets you hold today, most money you hold with banks, etc., all of that is digital uh, already. My issue with crypto assets is more that um, it, is, it is highly unregulated and there is a reason we regulate things like securities and, and assets. Uh, there, there, there's three reasons. Uh, we found over the 5,000 years that the world has had money, we have found that money can lead to three big dangers. One is systemic risk, bank, bank runs and, and all of that. The second is it is quite easy to screw customers once value is around, etc. So you have to protect customers often against these type of schemes. And the third thing is we have found that, that money is typically used for, for nefarious activities and money is a good way to control tax evasion and, and all of those things. And that's why we regulate the financial industry, that's why we have central banks, that's why we have lenders of, uh, of last resorts, that's why we have the SEC on securities uh, to make sure that securities offerings are true to value, they say what they do, etc. None of that exists in the in the crypto world, and I think that is none an issue. of that exists I, in the crypto world. I, I think that's an issue. I, well, I, I don't know how we can say none of that exists in the crypto, crypto world. Every Ripple transaction is going through a regulated endpoint to a regulated endpoint. There are no transactions that are not KYC. There's no transactions that are monitored for AML. So, I mean, look, I actually think using digital assets, and I had a, a the governor of a large central bank uh, in Southeast Asia say to me, if customers were using X Rapid, which is Ripple's XRP liquidity, it actually reduces systemic risk to a country, a, a small economy. Let me explain briefly what that means. Today, in order to, uh, if you're a bank in fill in blank country, you pre fund accounts around the world. If you're a small economy and you're pre funding billions of whatever the local currency is into other accounts, you actually are losing control over those. And when there are currency, runs when there are uh, challenges for local economies, that actually, that creates risk, in, increases the risk systemically. So if you didn't have to pre-fund, and that, but this is an observation that I didn't make, this is an observation that a central banker made to me, that if all of the banks in this particular country used X Rapid, the systemic risk would actually go down because they'd have more sovereign control over their own currency. Just to be clear, when we're talking crypto assets, in my mind, what I'm talking about is all the ICOs that are taking place. The, the oh, we agree the ICOs, on that. Um, Bitcoin itself, I mean, <laughs> most of the uses of Bitcoin these days seem to be ransomware and, and darknet uh, places. So I wasn't, I wasn't particularly focused right. on XRP, which I'm sure you have, have under control. But if I look at the broader world of, of digital assets, I think it is a highly unregulated world. I had a, I had a guy at uh, last week explain to me, uh, in, a Belgian who was working in China, his big business model was um, to put any type of assets, houses, planes and ships, on the blockchain and issue a token, a digital token for the ownership. He says, that's great. That way you can sell your plane, you can sell your house without paying any taxes, without knowing, <laughs> anybody knowing who's the beneficial owner, etc. His whole business model was essentially regulatory arbitrage, uh, etc. So that, that, that is a bit my... And if you listen to the libertarians, they're all like, well, this is great. We have no longer have government involvement. The people can take back their assets. And all I'm saying is, well, be careful. I mean, we're, there, there's a reason governments get involved when, it, when, when value is around. So that, that, that was more the point. In terms I, of your we, point we about the exposure, maybe I, I do think that as cross-border payments get faster, as they become real-time, I think that whole issue of volatility will be, will be solved as well. Um, and I also have to say, a lot of, a lot of the, the reason banks keep reserve and liquidity is also to be able to... Um, um, to clear the clear larger transactions, you really need that deep liquidity if you want to move large payments. Uh, mostly, is dollar, by the way, and that's why the dollar is so embedded in the global in the global system uh, at the end of the day. And yes, we can argue about the volatility of the dollar, but I think for most countries, it's a safe haven rather than a source of uh, sleepless nights. So <laughs> but of course, clear. Uncle Sam can change that any time. <laughs> just to be clear here, if there was more regulation, is crypto something that Swift would? 
be more optimistic about, that you would be more optimistic about? Our, our point of view has always been, listen, at the end of the day, we allow banks to move assets and, and money. Um, and and if, if banks, and I think you can even do that today, if you want to move, um, move something from a Bitcoin account to something else between banks, you can use the SWIFT system uh, to do that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a simple message account to account, and whether that account is denominated in dollars, euro, or, or Bitcoin, at the end of the day, is, is agnostic to us. Uh, we would expect that the banks then, then stick with the regulation that applies to, uh, to that one. Yeah. And I have to get you a clear answer here. We won't be off stage until I do. Is there a current agreement or partnership in the works between your companies? <laughs> Uh, no. Not that I know. <laughs> not that I know okay. Thank you. <laughs> Gottfried, I'm going to give you one more question because you'll be stepping down in June. So can you talk a little bit about your outlook for Swift once you're gone? What do you, what do you expect will be a bit of your legacy and then what's your hope going forward? Yeah, legacies are always a dangerous thing. Um, I, I think the leg for, for me, GPI is a big part of the legacy. I think it is transformational for correspondent banking. It really is the biggest change, at least in the 40 years that Swift has been, 45 years that Swift has been uh, in existence taking that to the, to the, next, uh, to the next century. Um, and under the hood, changing the whole technology stack from, from, from what it was uh, 20, 20, 30 years ago, mainframe, uh, uh, et cetera, towards cloud, APIs, containerization, all of, that, all of that stuff. That will be a journey, again, because of the 10,000 banks. Changing our own technology is relatively easy. Getting all of the 10,000 banks to embrace it and make it interconnected will be, uh, will be a longer journey. I think that will, be, that will really be, uh, in my mind, a big part of the legacy, turning not just SWIFT, but the banking community as a whole, the, the transaction banking community, and, and bringing them into the next century with all of the technologies that we, uh, that we have now have available. So that, that will be my, uh, my legacy. In terms of what I'm going to do, um, it, I don't think it's very different from what was in the press. Um, I'm going to take a few months to chill out. <laughs> I'm passionate about payments. I always have been. Before I joined Swift, I, I was a consultant uh, with McKinsey in the area of, uh, of payments. So I've, uh, I envision what's called a portfolio life. Um, which will be a combination of, of payments, fintech, uh, research. I, I, I did some academia in between as well, so uh, it will be a combination of that. But who knows? Ripple is hiring. <laughs> <laughs> the offer stands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Gabby.